Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Zatarans, a New Orleans tradition since 1889. And by French Market Coffee, locally roasted in New Orleans for 125 years. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. In virtually every line of work, a good mentor can provide immeasurable help. That's especially true in the culinary world, where a young, ambitious person can begin by washing dishes and eventually work their way up to executive chef without the benefit of culinary school. But if you're lucky enough to have John Besh or Aaron Sanchez as a mentor, sometimes that mentorship comes with a complete scholarship to the International Culinary Center in New York City. Famed chef Jeremiah Towers has mentored many, but unraveling who mentored who when it comes to his early career at Chez Panisse with Alice Waters is like trying to figure out what came first, the chicken or the egg. You could learn the answer to that in Anthony Bourdain's new documentary about Jeremiah entitled The Last Magnificent. We're spending the next hour with some real magnificence on this week's Louisiana Eats. I'm Chef John Besh with the John Besh Foundation. And I'm Chef Aron Sanchez with the Aron Sanchez Scholarship Fund. Aron Sanchez and John Besh have never been busier. Between television appearances, the two friends and business partners find themselves running numerous restaurants and businesses around the country. But apart from these projects, Aron and John work on scholarship programs year-round. When they recently visited us in our studio, I asked them why these projects are so important to them and what they hope to achieve. Gentlemen, welcome to Louisiana Eats. This is such an amazing and impressive thing that both of you all are occupied in. Tell me about your two foundations and scholarships and how this all works. You know, uh, one, we're just great friends, and uh, years ago we started... um, with this idea of creating a scholarship and uh, raising money to uh, create not only the scholarship per se, not only funding it, but also offering a mentorship process. Mentorship really being the key, I think, in both of our foundations and funds. Very much like uh, John had mentioned, I, I think it starts with friendship and uh, respect and admiration for for each other's narratives when it comes to food. And I think we have been so fortunate, John and myself, to get so many uh, rewards cooking in life. And it's only uh, logical to be able to give back and, and plant seeds for the future generation. And I mean, first of all, I have so much so much love for this man on many levels, but... I wish you would express it more often, Well, actually. <laughs> Jeez, really? See, you're still you're you're still needing more at this time. Uh, but the idea of also the, the seed money and the and the the micro loans to the the real sort of fabric and the culinary backbone of the New Orleans area, whether it's Vietnamese fishermen or Honduran people on the West Bank, it's just you know John has always been very uh, mindful of the, of that community, and he always says, "I'm using my God-given talents." to make the world a better place through food. What I've noticed years ago is that we're importing very well-educated white boys from suburbs across the country to come to New Orleans to cook New Orleans food. And if we continue on that path, then we're no longer going to have a New Orleans food. We have a culture here in New Orleans that is very diverse. We need to make sure that that diversity is represented in the highest uh, levels of the hospitality industry here in New Orleans. For me, I felt it's not fair for me to benefit from uh, the Latino workforce for all these years and not give back to them and provide the opportunities for these young ladies and men 
in, in, in the kitchens to, to excel and get those uh, management positions and those leadership roles, which was very difficult for me initially to, to uh, aspire to and to achieve. So this is what I'm trying to get accomplished with the Aron Sanchez Scholarship Fund is identify Latino youth here in, in New Orleans and allow them to have the systems and the support for them to really reach their culinary dreams. I'm very curious because obviously you both are very successful men with successful businesses. What was the moment that you suddenly decided that you looked at the ledger and said, it's time to balance the scales? You know, for me, it really it hit me after Hurricane Katrina that I saw how vulnerable our city is or was, especially at that time and still is for that matter. And it made me realize after the storm how important it was to be an employer, to provide somebody with stability um, meant a lot. And I saw a lot of lives change through that. And it, but it really broke my heart to see as we saw crime just uh, escalate after the storm that there's a lot of youth on our streets that don't realize that we have this incredible industry here in New Orleans and that too many people get washed aside and, and, and it's hard for them without a proper education to ever dream of something like this. So working with Cafe Reconcile across the street woke me up to the fact that we have talented, ambitious youth from these very streets that I'm talking about. I would every now and then get a call from the sister who's running a uh, Cafe Reconcile, and she would always send me her hard knock cases and say, uh, John, I need you to take care of so-and-so. We had this one kid. Uh, his first name was Warren. He worked very hard for us, opened up Dominica for us. He would come in at 4.30 in the morning, start the fires in the pizza ovens, bake the breads in the morning, doing whatever he could to, to gain knowledge so that he could go to culinary school. A week before he left to culinary school, he was murdered in his front yard. And it was at that point that, you know what, that's not enough. We, we have to do something. Let's create this foundation. Like Arun's talking about, we, we have this talent, we have these abilities, and we have these resources. How are we going to use those to affect a better outcome here in New Orleans? For me, I think the two more uh, significant and eye-opening uh, moments was when my mom closed her restaurant or just decided to sort of semi-retire after 30 years and the importance of keeping that legacy going. I think that was very important for me. And then also when Chef Paul Perdon passed away, uh, he was so important for me and helped me at a time when I was really vulnerable and at risk where I lost my father at, at a very, at a teenage uh, period of my life. And I just was rebellious. And he basically told my mom in so many words, sent him to me. I'm going to get him right, and he's going to live with me, and we're going to start from top to bottom for his behavior, his demeanor, and we're going to show him the value of work and teamwork. And that was really eye-opening. So when he passed, I felt, okay, what are we doing here? Like, let's be serious about it. And a couple different things happened. I think when Katrina came, it was the first really new influx of Latinos that came to New Orleans to help with the rebuild. But one of the things that John and I struggle on a constant basis is giving authenticity to our businesses. And one of them is by having the Latino workforce that I have been so spoiled with cooking 20 years in New York City and having gentlemen, ladies from Puebla supporting our, our restaurant uh, teams. And I just... I came to New Orleans and that wasn't the case. So hopefully with my scholarship and John's continued commitment to the community here in New Orleans, we'll be able to identify that segment, one of the many segments that needs love in New Orleans, to say that, hey, you have opportunities in the restaurant. Now, Aaron, Mm -hmm. before you started your own scholarship fund, Mm -hmm. you were participating in and helping John with mentorship in New York City. Mm-hmm. What's that experience like and what does that do for you? It was very um, enlightening for me because John was taking the, the time and the effort to identify the youth, making sure they went to New York City, which has, I, I think, some of the best culinary schools in the world. So it was really nice to have them be able to go to class all day, go through their studies, and then at night understand what the daily grind of being a chef and the investment that's needed uh, in order to excel. And I think 
uh, for me personally, being in New York at that time, cooking and having the restaurants that these young people can go to, it, it made sense because it gave it gave them a window uh, to what is expected. You know, it's a long days and it's going to be sacrifice and. Uh, for me personally, I've always had this connection, this love affair with New Orleans, and having John's recipients work with me allowed me to stay connected to New Orleans, and that's what was very gratifying about it. What was the greatest challenge they ever threw your way? Uh, well, you know, I just think the idea of, of bringing somebody, a young person from New Orleans that maybe is uh, overwhelmed or don't never seen a subway yeah you know, subway and or an airplane or an airplane and, and have a, and, and they have a very particular accent and you know they're from New Orleans and they're rough around the edges and then trying to uh, allow this young person to feel like they're they're, they're in, in great company and they have the support that's always a challenge what I saw just witnessing you know and Oro was really good with um Hey, are you free next week? Let's go get dinner. Mm-hmm. Or hey, are you free next week? Let's go. I want to go show you Chinatown, or you know, or introduce you to somebody. Or you know, you you're very instrumental in just opening there so many doors for people. So, part of the scholarship is that you go to New York, you go to class, and at night you work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll work in a restaurant. Generally, they're working in Danny Meyer restaurants. He's just been phenomenal to uh, you know in the way that he's helped us, and that was a door opened by Aron. Now uh, you know, our recipients will go through school, then they'll leave us, and we I'll place them in. I'll uh, call T. Martin or I'll call um, you name it, Justin Devilliers. Emerald has been awesome with taking in our recipients, and as, as well as other great chefs around the city, and we'll place them with other great chefs to continue that mentorship process. I mean, it's not about the education. It's about building friendships. It's about building trust and having somebody that you can know and believe in that will give you guidance throughout your career. Yeah, and I think the most important thing, too, just to to, uh, to echo what John was saying, was you don't want a young person to only know one mentor. You want them to have multiple narratives, and through that process, that young person is going to form their own culinary identity and style. And that's the one thing that my mom was very adamant about was like, I don't, you need to develop your style. So when people go to your restaurant, they taste your food, they say, that's an Adon dish, or that's a John Besh dish. So you, you put all of your hopes and dreams and nickels behind a kid who doesn't make it. How does that feel? The, as far as the scholarship goes, you're not there to do anything else than to help a person achieve their dream. It's easy to get distracted. And if I had a scholarship when I was 19 years old, I would have gotten distracted. Me too. If, mm-hmm. if it weren't for the Marine Corps sending me away, uh, yeah. I, I would. if I had had a scholarship and sent to New York City, and you know, these things happen. And so we've Lost one scholarship recipient from the program since we started, and that's and, and he not happened too to be bad. assigned to be. You know, a lot of I think, especially young people of ethnic backgrounds, strive for mentors that are not rappers and athletes. You know, and my whole thing is like, okay, cool, you're a tough kid, you have some tattoos, and you're from the inner city. Guess what? Being a chef is cool. You yeah. get to have tattoos. You get to work hard. It's awesome but it takes a long time to get there where you can flaunt that and i think sometimes uh the comfortability with uh with my lifestyle perhaps might allow these kids to think that they have it already and it's a privilege to be able to you know to kind of get there and it takes time and sadly this young person you know he was probably one of the more troublesome young men we've had and you know I think one of the most talented yeah. young men and, mm-hmm. and there have been many times in my life where I've made mistakes and I've learned by those mistakes the best chefs in our company yep. have been chefs that we've wanted to fire in the past and they've they've turned they saw the adversity and they've turned themselves around and and so I think that even this gentleman that lost his scholarship the silver lining is that might be something that ignites something within him to propel himself forward. Chef Aaron Sanchez and Chef John Besh with the Aaron Sanchez Scholarship Fund 
and the John Besh Foundation. Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets and from the Napoleon House, located in the historic French Quarter, home of the Pim's Cup Cocktail and the Toasted Mufalada. Lunch, dinner, and private events at 500 Charter Street. But on March 23rd, you can enjoy a meal specially prepared by the Napoleon House chef, Chris Montero, at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, home of Louisiana Eats. For more information, visit poppytooker.com. My name is Alfred Singleton. I'm the chef, co-owner of Cafe Sabisa at 1011 Decatur in the French Quarter. The path that led Alfred Singleton to becoming chef and now co-owner of the historic Cafe Sabisa in New Orleans' French Quarter was filled with twists and turns. One thing that was a constant throughout his career was powerful mentorship. His cooking career began at his godmother's poor boy shop in the Lower Ninth Ward, where he peeled potatoes and shrimp, through terms of duty at some of the Crescent City's best restaurants, and now, finally, to Cafe Sabisa. Well, Chef, I have to tell you, I have a huge amount of admiration for you. Thank you. you. you, you, You are a special guy, and actually, your life with food started... When you were just a little boy of five, you worked in a family restaurant. Yeah, well, my family owned a small sandwich shop in the Lower Ninth Ward. It was called Ross Restaurant. Uh, On the other side of the Industrial Canal, we we did everything from poor boys to Creole favorites, gumbo, etouffees, and, uh, of course, great bread puddings and sweet potato pies and things like that. So a lot of Southern influence inside of that restaurant. So approximately what year was it when your family started that restaurant? Uh, it was in the early 70s, and it lasted until the late 80s. Um, and uh, my godmother got older, and um, you know she just wanted to get out of the business. So at late 80s, about 89, I believe, was when she got out of the restaurant. What are your earliest memories of being in a restaurant kitchen? Just peeling shrimp and peeling potatoes, helping out, just being a rug rat around the kitchen, <laughs> bothering everybody that was there, but also um, just being real passionate about it, wanting to do it and wanting to uh, be a part of something. So when you first started cooking, what were the things that you were cooking up there? Well, uh, amazingly, you know, I, I was into the pool boys heavy, you know, and, and she was real famous for uh, her her pool boys and her hot sausage sandwiches and her hamburgers because they were all bread lent and the way they constructed their patties and the meats that went on those sandwiches were real real unique so um, no other place in the city were doing that I mean and and, and they would call them up the arm sandwiches up the arm sandwiches up the arm sandwiches <laughs> because they were they they do it up the arm and it would be forearm lent. And that went on to the griddle to, to cook. So, you know, that, that to me was just amazing. And I always wanted to learn to do that. And that was probably the first thing that I learned to do besides peeling shrimp and potatoes. At what point did you decide to pursue a life in food? I was a sophomore in high school um, when I actually began my journey in, in the food industry. Um, you know, the first thing I did was I, I walked into Ralph Brennan Baco. And um, I just wanted a job at the at that point. And when I walked into the restaurant, you know, they were cleaning a whole salmon, and I was applying for a dishwasher job. And you know, immediately, you know, when I saw him cleaning a salmon, I was like, I want to do that. You know, the the feeling that 
took over me when I saw that, that, that let me know that, you know, food is my passion and that's what I wanted to do. So from a sophomore in high school, I was always in the kitchen around food and real ambitious about what was happening. And, you know, it just paid off for me. <laughs> well, you didn't go to culinary school. No, no. You know, you were sort of born into this life. Right. You were at Cafe Sabisa a long time ago. So when did your career there begin? Um, I believe it was 96, 97. I went to Cafe Sabisa. I walked in the door and I was hired um, as a Barca f- food runner. I was hired as that. And that's where I actually met Alan Hequis, um, who was uh, the executive chef at Cafe Sabisa. Um, and ironically, about my second or third week there, uh, the guy who was the sous chef at Cafe Sabisa, he decided he didn't want to work there anymore. And, you know, he just went on, went away. So we were short in the kitchen and um, I was still a food runner busser. And I told Alan, I was like, man, let me let me, you know, try this. Let me do this. And uh, they put me there, and and I mean it was like clockwork. They were like, "You're a natural." They also they, they didn't call me Alfred. They called me Fred, and I can hear you, <laughs> Fred. You're a natural, and and you know. So they began to work with me. And Alan was a instructor at the Culinary Institute of New Orleans uh, when it was up on St. Charles Avenue uh, for a long time, and uh, he saw that in me and decided that uh, he wanted to mentor me. And I told him, I said, I want to go to culinary school and really learn this. He was like. You know, don't waste the money for it. Let me teach you personally. And he did. I mean, he gave me books and and that were uh, distributed at the College Institute of New Orleans. He gave me tests. You know, he quizzed me all the time about certain things and really just uh, began to, you know, just to teach me and mentor me in food and flavors and understand it. The first thing he really did was really taught me how to get around the kitchen you know, taught me about different pans and spoons and just kitchen staples. You know, I had I had to first learn what the word staples meant <laughs> because for me, he's saying staples. I'm like, where's the stapler? You know, and <laughs> and he, you know, so he 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 really taught me the verbiage and the things that I really needed uh, to to be successful. And it went from one extreme to the next. And you know, before you know it, you know, I, I'm just you know, I'm creating specials and, and, and doing these things that, and, you know, in my first and second year in the business, which was amazing. So um, I was just real happy to have that opportunity to, to take on that, that challenge and, and have him mentor me. And then you left Cafe Sabisa for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe three years later, I followed Alan uh, to the Red Room on St. Charles Avenue, uh, when it was the Red Room, Carlos Gear was leaving to go to Commander's Palace in Las Vegas. Um, so I worked with Alan Heck. Was he called me? He was like, "You know, I want you to come up and I want you to be my miniature sous chef." That's what he told me. <laughs> and I was like, "Man, I don't know nothing about being a sous chef." He's like, "You're gonna be fine. Trust me." So I went there, and the Red Room was a supper club, you know, and it, it turned to like a nightclub after hours. And um, but what was great about that it was it was me seeing a different cuisine. You know, I went from Creole to French American kind of Mediterranean cooking. So four years in the business and, you know, I'm already versed in three different cuisines, you know, and, and it just went from there. I mean, that, that was awesome. So I stayed at uh, the Red Room for about two years and then I went back to Cafe Sabisa. Craig called me and he was like, I want you to be my chef. And I'm just like, man, you got to be kidding me. So, th- so now you get your first big chef job, right? And I and and, and listen, I, I was I was. If there's another word for frightened, that was me, <laughs> because I had no idea what I was doing. I really didn't. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm 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 pulling away from Allen. I'm on my own. So now I need to self educate. I need to read books. I need to buy books. I used to drive my wife crazy with. You know, the way I was buying cookbooks and, and, and things like that, because I just I knew I had to get it because now it's like, OK, you're at the top. You're the guy. So you have to really, you know, impress and and, and you have to put your money where your mouth is. 
Um, it took me a long time to understand the business, the operational side of the business, you know, the numbers and the labor and uh, the food costs and ordering pars. And, and that's where I had Craig Napoli who, who took some time to show me, like, no, you go to them and tell them they need to give you a better price. And if they don't give you a better price, you're going to someone else. And, um, you know, so he helped me along the way with that. So, you know, when I left there, uh, I went to the Dickie Brennan family, which, you, you know, that's that's the first family of food in this city. You know, I spent some time working for Dickie and, and you know, that family and um, just the values and, and morals that they instill in you when you work for them. Um, those really pay dividends in, in, in your, your path to success. So i um, very thankful to have that opportunity to work for that family and, and, and you know, lead their kitchens as well. So And the management, you know, yeah. do you see yourself as just being uh, – a natural leader because you're the lead dog in the kitchen, you know, right. you, you got to be at the head of the team. Well, your personality is everything in the kitchen. And, um, you know, you, you, you really have to know how to manage a ton of personalities because you're going to have people from all walks of life. And, um, and, and it took me a long time to get this, but I learned this working for Dickie that, you know, about giving people the benefit of the doubt because you never know what they're going through. So my direction is there. When I want something, you know I want it. And I don't have to yell, I don't have to throw pots and pans, or I don't have to kick trash cans, because I, I form relationships with my people. You know, I always tell them whether it's personal or, 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 or professional, you can talk to me about any situation, and I'm gonna give you the best advice that I can possibly give you. But also, you know, you have to know that I have a job to do. And the business won't suffer, you know, for you being a bad apple, you know, and I'm, you know, and, and, I, and just how we're talking right now, mm. this is how this is how level I am at all times in the kitchen. So now you have your own restaurant. You're a partner in a restaurant. Right. Well, I was um, lucky enough to have been there the evening that you all had your big open house welcome party. Mm -hmm. And I know your parents were there. Yes. yes. And. What did they have to say about this? You know, my parents are so proud of what I've done. Um, and, you know, um, I, I've i kind of defeated the odds uh, for an African-American male in the city of New Orleans, of course. Um, but, you know, my parents, have they've been so supportive and so proud of everything that I've accomplished. And, and you know, my mom is recovering from a stroke and she all... November 11th was the first day that she's done anything since she's had the stroke. And that's how much that meant to her. She's walking, but she's not fully walking the way that, you know, she wants to be. And she's still rehabbing, you know, as far as that's concerned. But she just had to be there. You know, my father, he, he you know, he's a couch potato. <laughs> you know, he, he worked all of his life. He retired. And now he's just he just wants to be home and watch sports all day. He don't want to get out of the house to do anything, and so he, he, this meant enough to him for him to get out of the house to him for him to come. And I was just so honored to have them. Um, they've never saw me in my element. They've never saw me, you know, a, as as a chef owner or you know professionally. Whenever I'm around, I'm. You know, we're, we're family, so we're all relaxed and things like that. So that was the first time that they've really ever saw me in my element. So I was just so excited. And my mom, she, she's a hard person to please. She she doesn't like much, but what she likes, she likes, and that's it. You know, chicken is her thing. <laughs> chicken, like any, you do chicken any kind of, chicken and crab. You do chicken any kind of way. Stew it, fry it, bake it, brawl it, whatever. Or she'll love that. So she always say, oh, man, you, you're cooking that fancy five-star food. I need one-star food. That's what she always <laughs> tells me. I'm like, nah, you, you have to try something different. So she came in and, and she tried. I mean, she was just so impressed, you know, by the level of service that she received, how warm and welcome the staff made her feel. Um, she never goes and, and writes reviews for anything. And she went and wrote a review. Wow! Like I mean, but so she was she was just so impressed, and and you know they're they're just so proud 
of where I've come and how I've grown because I was a troublemaker as a teenager. <laughs> I really was. And, and, you know, nobody really never saw this coming. And I'm just so excited that, you know, I can do something to make my family proud and, um, you know, just kind of um, be different. Chef Alfred Singleton of Cafe Sabisa. Which edible insect is served at John Besh and Aaron Sanchez's restaurant, Johnny Sanchez? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, and from French Market Coffee. French Market Coffee's premium blend beans are locally roasted in small batches, creating a coffee that can only be called New Orleans Bold. Here's this week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. Which edible insect is served at John Besh and Aaron Sanchez's restaurant, Johnny Sanchez? They're called chapulines and are an add-on with Johnny Sanchez's guacamole. They're commonly eaten in certain areas of Mexico, especially the Oaxaca region. Chapulines are collected there from the time they hatch in early May through late summer. After they're thoroughly washed, they're toasted with garlic, lime juice, and often the extract of another famous Mexican insect, the agave worms found sometimes in tequila and mezcal. I'm Poppy Tooker, and at Johnny Sanchez, chapulines on guacamole make for good Louisiana eat. My name is Jeremiah Tower. I'm a chef and author of cookbooks, and I'm a scuba diver. <laughs> People ask me, well, do you have a business card? And I say, no. And they say, well, why not? And I said, well, I don't know what to put on it. Well, I can think of a few things that business card might say. Jeremiah Tower's legendary career has spanned multiple countries and earned many awards. Beginning his career in the early days of Alice Waters Chez Panisse in Berkeley, Jeremiah transported his culinary vision along the California coast and all the way to Asia. Now Jeremiah is the subject of an impassioned documentary produced by culinary bad boy number one, Anthony Bourdain. Before we could get the inside scoop on the film, Jeremiah took us back to his unlikely culinary origins. Well, my training was being ignored by my parents, you know, which in the right location is an amazing education. I mean, they traveled all over the world first class with me. I mean, I was, went around the world twice before I was 16. Um, but then, you know, when I was 30, my grandfather died and my allowance stopped. So I figured, you know, there was a terrible shock. I bet. That I had to actually work for a living, you know, and I didn't know what. I was just trained as an architect in uh, graduate school at Harvard, and then I went out in the world, and it turns out I was a lousy architect. And then 
in San Francisco, I ran out of money. So I took the first job that I could find, which was as a, as a chef in this r- little restaurant called Chez Panisse in Berkeley. Oh, just some little restaurant in Berkeley called Chez Panisse. Well, it and, was a little restaurant. How did, you know. how, but how did you get the job as chef? What, were, what was your qualification? Well, they were more desperate than I was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they said, come and be interviewed at 6 o'clock on a certain day. And I showed up at 6 o'clock. And of course... That shows you how little they knew about the restaurant business because at 6 o'clock is when your first customers are served. You don't give interviews, you know, then. So they said, oh, no, no, come, you know, it's, we can't talk to you. Come back tomorrow. So I went out on the sidewalk, and then I thought, wait a minute. This just cost me $5.25 in the bus here and to go back. So I went back inside, and I said, look, you told me to be here at 6 o'clock. I was, and I want my interview. And they said... No, we can't talk to you. We can't talk to you. And Alice, well, I didn't know, but was standing there and said, well, do something to the soup. And there was this huge pot of soup because everybody got soup. I and mean, there was only one menu for everyone. And I tasted it and I added salt and cream because I probably put cream in everything in those days. And they tasted it and went, wow. <laughs> 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 Come back tomorrow. And I did, and they interviewed me, and I gave them some menus. And the next thing I knew, I was the executive chef. And the first day I showed up, there was no one in the kitchen. I was on my own. So I just thought, well, I'm just going to cook whatever I know how to do, you know. How long had Chez Panisse been open at the time you went to work there? About a year. Well, those were very exciting times. Yes, and it's hard to for anyone to think back how simple those times were. When I say there were no fresh herbs, I mean, let's face it, everything in Whole Foods and those days didn't exist at all. No olive oil, no fresh herbs, no, I mean, the cheeses were Vela Jack, mm-hmm. which I didn't know, I'd never cooked with, didn't know how to cook with it properly. Um, so I refused to cook with anything except perfect, perfect ingredients. And there weren't any. So we set about finding them. And that's where f- that foraging came from. Well, from that period of time, when you look back on it, what were the best of times and what were the worst of times? There were a few worst times. I mean, there was one when the dishwasher cut off his finger and it was <gasps> in the bottom of the sink and it was very dirty, you know, oily water. And there was a, we sent him to the hospital with a busboy or some, a taxi. And there was a call on the kitchen phone and it was the hospital saying, well, where's the finger? <gasps> and I went, you know... Uh-huh. As a chef, I don't think about fingers that much. You know? <laughs> oh. But, you know, you could, I couldn't ask anyone else to go into that sink. So I was in there with my two hands, trying going around the bottom of the sink until I found the finger. And, you know, there were no Ziploc bags in those days. So we'd put it in saran wrap and send it in another taxi over to the hospital. That, that's a typical restaurant day. <laughs> well, that's kind of a rough day. But if the, you ask me. the highlight, you know, was when we did... Uh, blue trout, live trout cooked to order, which we'd brought up on a big truck from Big Sur. Evenings like that, that was the champagne dinner. That was brilliant. The California Regional Dinner in 1976, when I finally said, why are we beating our heads against the wall with, you know, trying to cook food from Corsica or Brittany or whatever, since we are using the best of the local ingredients, why not just call it that? So I would put on, in 1976, I put on the California Regional Dinner. The menu was in, in English. The wines were all from California. And that's what caught the press's imagination, that caught James Beard's imagination. And he wrote endlessly about it. Well, you leave that sort of charming, intimate Chez Panisse. And not too terribly long later, you end up with, the amazing phenomena that was stars. Tell us about your time at stars. We could never have done stars if I'd just gone cold into it the way I did at Chez Panisse. I had a team, a core team, together by that time. At the opening day, the people at the reception desk said to me, so what kind of restaurant is it? Of course, nobody had read the, the handbook that we'd handed out to the staff. So I said, well, you know, it's an American brasserie. And they said, what's the dress code? I said, everything from blue jeans to black tie. So at the end of the night, I went over to them and said, okay, so, you know, what was the feedback? And she said, every time I said American Brassie, everybody went, 
Oh, yeah, fine. And I said, well, that's more than we know. I have no clue what an American brasserie <laughs> is. And she said they loved everything from blue jeans to black tie, which, of course, is how it turned out. The food, again, we did the different menu every day. It was just whatever we wanted to do that you could do for 500 people for dinner, you know. 500 people, what an enormous number. The, the most we ever did was 701, and that's when I was working the door. And the busboys were so terrified of me that they cleared the tables twice as fast. We did 701 instead of 500. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the kitchen begged me never to be on the door again, you know. Do you have any particular memories of some characters who we may or may not know that you saw some interesting things created in the dining room between people? Well, I mean, one of my favorite memories is Danielle Steele on the opening night of the opera. And she was seated, you know, on table 25, which is the sort of most visible but also protectable table at Stars. And she came in and she told, warned me in advance, you know, that the, the Dior was $200,000 a dress. The diamonds were a few million, that kind of thing. So, Jeremiah, please, she said, no red wine within 10 feet of my table, you know. And, of course... <laughs> I knew that, you know, she was in this perfect dress, which fit perfectly. She'd have a green salad, but no dressing because you couldn't have olive oil on this Dior. So the, the staff were in a, you know, they were just so excited. They figured, oh, my God, you can, that's my rent payment for the month, you know. And so I said to the waiter, no, no, you, you do that, you know. But the table behind her is your big tip. It was two couples, underage, so I served them champagne all night long. <laughs> sort of out for the prom, you know, and they mm. didn't know anything. They were, had never seen anything like that before. And he and I waited on both tables. And I, you know, poured the champagne for the young couple so that the waiter wouldn't get arrested. And that was typical stars. And Daniel Steele just thought that was, she told me later, amazing that I'd put, you know, these two, four babies right next to her. You know, when you have... Uh, a restaurant that famous, and sooner or later, everybody in the world walks through it. And so when you've got, you know, uh, Pavarotti and my great pal Rudolf Nureyev and Barbara Streisand and, you know, on and on and on, the Kirk Douglas, Gregory Peck, I mean, all of Hollywood and Washington, the Reagans coming through, all of that, you get a bit, at least I would get a bit blasé, not blasé, but I would just get a bit bored with all that glamour, you know. So... <laughs> You mean you weren't yeah. starstruck at stars? Well, I was in the beginning, but then, you know, I was too, too struck. You know, the sort of wasn't struck anymore. So when somebody, kids like that or students would come in, or the young corps de ballet, you know, who had no money, I would, of course, pay for them all, you know, because that added a huge atmosphere to stars. It wasn't just the f most famous people in the world. I mean, they attracted customers, okay, but that's a pretty boring scene if that's all it is. So now at this point in your life, Anthony Bourdain decides to make a documentary about you. W what did you think when he approached you about this? It must be a very odd and kind of spooky feeling at the same time. Well, not as spooky as having to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really weird. No, but when he asked me, I thought, hold on a second. Ten years ago... Anthony Bourdain said I was a traitor for leaving the industry, okay? A year or two after that, he said I was a train wreck. And then a couple of years after that, he said the first vaguely nice thing about <laughs> me. And a couple of years after that, I uh, met him and he said, oh, Jeremiah, you know, I really admire you. And I'm thinking, you do? And then I met him in New York and he, you know, Anthony, of course, is incredibly charming. He's probably the most brilliant person I've ever met, the way he can verbalize all the huge knowledge that he has very well. I, I, I adore him. Anyway, so I said, yeah, okay, I mean, it's a very weird idea, but, you know, he's very persuasive. So I said, yeah, and they said, well, would you do a test? And then he told me a few things about meeting Alice Waters. When Anthony called her the Paul Pot of the culinary world, or the Khmer Rouge of the culinary world or something, and I just thought, that's pretty extreme, you know. So my private theory 
is that he was so pissed at Alice, he thought he'd do a, a movie about me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations, no matter how it comes yes. about. Yeah, of It's a wonderful thing to be immortalized like this. So how is it to watch yourself in a documentary? What are we going to see and learn about you when we see this? It's, it's a very strange feeling. The first time I saw it, it was in a big theater, empty theater in New York, because the director, Lydia Tenalia, who's brilliant from Zero Point Zero, she thought I'd be really pissed off, but I was actually too stunned because it's to see yourself on the big screen, especially when, you know, it's a version of your life. Then the second time I saw it was at the Tribeca Film Festival on a big screen. And there was dead silence for what seemed like forever. It was probably five minutes, but it seemed like 20 minutes. You know. And I turned to Lydia sitting next to me and I said, run for it. <laughs> And then some woman giggled, and the whole place cracked up. So then it was, and then we could, it was fine. And I decided, you know, there's no point doing this unless you just blab. Yeah. You know, don't try and sculpt it, you know, for the best press or something. I mean, if it was going to be a fluff job, it would just be stupid. So I didn't. So the first question was, what was your father like? And out of my mouth, I was jet lagged and tired and didn't have a glass of champagne. So I said, he was a prick. And I went, oh, my God, what have I just said? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came from. You know, after, you know, 50 years of wanting to say it, I guess. I don't know. But once I'd said it, I thought I relaxed and went, OK, whatever. Well, you were certainly, I think, prepared to take that task on because you, of course, wrote a very, very frank memoir. And... You know, memoirs are very popular these days, but not everybody really manages to take such um, a long, hard look at themselves and just tell the truth. And um, you you really pulled that off. How, how long ago did you write that book? Um, California Dish came out in 2003. Um, that was the first book I wrote when I was in New York. And the new one, it, the re total remake of the book comes out in April next year called Start the Fire. Well, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. And I have to say it has been such an incredible honor to have this opportunity to sit and visit and have this very frank conversation with one of the greats in American food, Jeremiah Towers. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you, Bobby. The honor is mine. Chef, restaurateur, and author, Jeremiah Tower. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Tune in next week when we commemorate Black History Month by visiting the only slavery museum in the country, Louisiana's Whitney Plantation. They leave early in the morning before daybreak, and they come back when the sun goes down. That's why they say they worked from Kansas to Kansas. On Thursday, March the 23rd, Louisiana Eats is teaming up with French Market Coffee for our next Celebrity Chef Dinner, benefiting our home at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Join us for an evening of fun and fine dining as Chef Chris Montero of the Napoleon House prepares a three-course meal right before your very eyes with wines paired by BIM 428. To see the menu and buy tickets, visit my website, poppytooker.com. Have you missed an episode of Louisiana Eats? Hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com, where you can also subscribe to the podcast and take us with you wherever you go. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's French Market Coffee, and Rouse's Markets. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau and from the Palace Cafe, home of crab meat cheesecake 
and white chocolate bread pudding in the historic Whirline Music Building on Canal Street. Original theme music by Johnny Sketch in the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to producers Joe Schreiner, Sarah Holtz, and Reggie Morris. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. I'm Poppy Tooker. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. <laughs>